Well, hi guys. I'm back. Uh, thanks for your comments, and I will get back to answering them. Uh, this is actually the next day after I did that, so I haven't had a chance uh, to really get on there, but I have read them and everything, and there's a I, I kind of did wanted not only to give you an update of where I'm at on this radio, but also I wanted to, uh, there was a couple questions on there and a couple comments, and I thought it'd be just simpler to answer them in this video. Uh, start out with, I have cleaned the chassis up. These are the rust points here, 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 here. Uh, I have smeared a little bit of Vaseline on them and left it overnight and so far the rust has not came back. I'm going to leave it a little longer. Uh, at this point in time, if it doesn't come back, uh, as long as I keep something on them, uh, then I'm probably not going to worry about them too much. Um, so, I mean, the tuning condenser sits here. This is the front end of the radio, so uh, this little blotchy nest here, which is the worst, will not be really seen once the radio's back in. Uh, this one here is going to be pretty much covered up by the transformer sitting here. Um, you have the two tall uh, filter cans that will be sitting right in here. So that one will be almost hidden. So when you're looking at from the radio from the back side, you've got a lot of stuff that's going to be really showing it up. Now the, this here is the glue that they smear on to glue the tag on. It's literally in, almost impossible to, to really clean it off without being extreme aggressive. The only little bad spot is right here, and I'm really just not going to really be concerned about it. Uh, the rest of the radio kind of came out pretty decently. Um, this is where I'm at. I removed a lot of stuff out of here and uh, the next stage will be I get get rid of this. This is the uh, old speaker wire. It is in pretty darn bad shape. This is actually the best of it right here. But as it goes on out to the speaker it was really uh, pretty much um, in bad shape as typical most of these are. Uh, this went to the tone control. It's the only piece of rubber, actual rubber, open rubber wire and of course as usual it needs to be replaced. So that's where I'm at on that. One thing I wanted to show you was uh, I, I went ahead and tore the transformer apart. Uh, fortunately it did decide to come apart reasonably easy. I've had these that had bur burned up in the past um, where the actual core, the laminations, wouldn't come out without being extraordinarily aggressive because the, uh, <coughs> they actually had gotten hot enough and it burned out the, uh, burned up the inner uh, coil form and a lot of the windings actually ended up melting right onto the, the core laminations. Uh, the first thing you always run into when you tear a transformer apart is your filament windings, and that's basically what they are. <laughs> uh, you know, they should look something, um, well, I don't have a piece of enameled wire here, but they shouldn't look like this. This is both of them in here, they just kind of fell away. Uh, they're, you can tell, they're just, they're gone. There's not, nothing left to the enamel and stuff. So this would be your 5 volt and 6.3 both in here in this uh, mess. Uh, it is a heavier wind, uh, windings than what you'll find in the rest of the transformer because um, your filaments draw a lot more current. They're low voltage, high current. This is the uh, what's left. And if you look closely, and hopefully it will show up, that right there, there was a lead that hooked here, it hooked to this wire right here, and it literally 
had melted. So that's quite typical um, to get plenty hot enough to actually start melting copper. So this is all just gone right here. Um, so and the other lead was here. There's a little bit of melting here. Uh, these would have been probably the two primary connecting leads that was here and it just took them out. Um, like I said when I took the clamshells off those two wires literally just fell away because they were fully disconnected but the secondary here is high voltage secondary winding um, you know there, there would have been this paper in here which is just now just nothing but carbon um, would have been between that and they'd been in there, but yeah. Uh, to give you some idea what kind of heat, you know, that should tell you what kind of heat that you can get from one of these um, when they short. Uh, no fuse protection on the radio, and depending on the outlet that it was plugged into. That outlet could have, you know, could have been a 20 amp fused outlet. And if it was 120 volts and there was nothing else on that circuit that was operating at the time, it would have had a full available 20 amps to go into this radio if it asked for it. And that's 2400 watts. Uh, to give you some idea, 65 watt soldering iron at full temp controlled is shy of 900 degrees by one degree Fahrenheit so it's 899 degrees and that's controlled 65 watts actually can produce more heat than that but that they control it to protect the heating element and the tip uh, so that's considerably less and that will more than enough melt uh, solder um, it takes about, um, I believe it's 1,200 degrees to start melting copper, so or, or somewhere in that percent, 12 to 1,500 degrees. Uh, I do know that you can buy um, a small melting uh, smelter melting oven that is a bench top. Those, the heating elements, and those are only 1,800 watt, so uh, electric ones. So this had available to it a lot more. So that's why it just melted. These things really get extraordinarily hot until something fails. It probably didn't blow the fuse. It bailed out the primary, disconnected itself. Okay. Now on to a few other things. Um, I've got the uh, fake like blocks emptied out and basically cleaned out ready for the capacitors uh, these uh, have a number on the side you can look through the parts list in the schematic or on I believe it's philcoradio.com you can find uh, a spread a little spreadsheet on this or at least they have the link to it but anyway uh, that you can they've got these numbers out and they tell you how it shows what size values is in here how they hook up everything so that you can download so those are clean and ready to go I've got the uh, uh, tone control ready to receive its capacitors and wire um, I decided, I, I checked out the uh, volume control completely, it, it, it does have a decent sweep, it's a little stiff, so it was not hard to take one of these apart, so I took it apart, uh, this is, the, that's the switch, got an insulator, um, this is how it works, and the reason it's stiff, that what appears to be like white stuff is a grease that they put in there and it's getting pretty dried up on the very outside here is a carbon that uh, a material um, 
that's got carbon put on it. Uh, that's your resistive element. Connects between here and here. And it, it's like a, oh, a heavy gauge car, um, cardboard, electrical cardboard like material, cardstock. And they uh, basically uh, deposit the carbon on them. But the way this one works, unlike a more newer type of um, um, rheostats or potentiometers, uh, instead of directly dragging the center conductor, the wiper, over the carbon, they've got a metal, uh, a steel band that runs around, hooks to the center conductor. They got a the shaft is hooked to a spring-loaded arm that hooks to and it's a piece of wood is what it is it hooks a piece of wood that pushes up tight so wherever it pushes against against that carbon that makes your conductive path through the resistance between here and here or here and here so that's how that works but um, the grease in it they, they'll put a grease in there and uh, to make it work nice it has pretty well dried up after all these years. It, it's Some of it's still a little bit, um, I can pick it up off of my finger, but it's, it's um, so I'm going to use some deoxidant, clean it out, and put a little new lube in there. And of course here's your power switch. That's some more of that real dried up grease on there. So that's how it works. I've got the uh, can rebuilt, uh, five capacitors in here, I've just put some tape around them. Uh, these wires easily went, uh, went through the hole without any problems. Uh, different colors for different sections of the cap and then this comes around we'll ground to the can. The can was originally grounded here, there's what's left of the lead, it'll fit in there. Down in, at this end is another piece that goes in inside. They'll fit down here. It just slides down in there and is held in. And then this will slide in. I'm uh, going to take probably some cardboard, uh, thin cardboard to put in around this just to hold this. Otherwise, it wants to fall in. And then uh, probably just hit it with a little bit. Uh, not much uh, hot glue and then bend the tabs over so it stays secure. I want to talk a little bit about something on the schematic and the IS. Um, the schematic has a couple mistakes, um, quite typical. You will run into mistakes on schematics. Um, Number one is it says two ohms for this. Uh, this is the 6.3 filament winding, and two ohms for the 5 volt winding. That is should be 0.2, not two. Um, mo uh, virtually almost any transformer you ever test and check the filament windings, they're not going to be you know and whole number ohmage values that are going to be a decimal point you know uh, point one, point two, point three, something of that nature so that's one mistake the other mistake is right here uh, and actually there's one there too uh, the primaries are correct 34 ohms for the IFs the secondaries it says 47 it should be 45 this one says 85, it should be 45. That is the real number, 34 and 45, 34 and 45. These are exactly the same windings. They, the IF transformers basically are relatively exactly the same IF transformers, although they do have a different part number. Two reasons for that. Uh, the biggest thing I want you to pay attention to is the windings. They are same spaced so the coupling is exactly the same between the two windings 
primary and secondary. They are the same number of windings so and same size wire. So same values. Effectively the same transformers. Um, the reason for the different part number is right here. This one here is the first IF. This is the grid cap going to the 78 tube. It's because it's got a grid cap lead where this one is the second IF. It doesn't need the grid cap lead because this actually connects to the diodes and the 75 tube. So now they are a different length on the form which is wood. Uh, the reason for that is is they were you know they deemed it necessary that the 78 tube set in here would have a shield um, you know a tube has a certain you know they're so tall they got a certain height and we deemed that we needed to shield that tube well if I use this size of can made this transformer exactly like this using the same coil form my grid lead would be quite a bit longer coming out and having to come way up and attach where here it's at pretty much the same level and height to the grid cap so it's just a short distance run running here they would have probably ended up putting a shielded lead on it this way they didn't have to put the shield saving some money uh, so that's the other the only other difference those two differences grid lead uh, grid cap lead and and the length here just to get it so it this lead can be shorter was is the only two reasons why there's a, a difference in the part number uh, this little ugly lookingness bubbliness that's uh, the wax this wax is a special wax that they use uh, I don't want to say the wax itself is special. It's just basically beeswax. Or, uh, but what, what it is, is they actually, before they use it, they mix it uh, in a blender. basically homogenizes it, meaning they actually induce uh, a gas into it. Basically, it's nitrogen, carbon dioxide, and gas into it. Uh, mixture. And why they do that is because the coil form is wood wood no matter how much work you put at it wood will never be hundred percent dry you cannot kiln drying wood to a point that has zero moisture content and you wouldn't want to because it'd be dry rotted basically what's called dry rot it'd just fall apart so they didn't want the moisture attacking the coils so they used this and the idea of it is is that uh, these things get a little warm, not like a heat of a tube, but they warm up a little bit. A slight little bit increase in temperature above room temperature will cause it to start bubbling out gassing. As it does, it, it makes a pocket for moisture. Now you can remelt this, put your heat gun on real low or use a, a hair dryer, and it'll draw back in. It's fine. It won't hurt it. You can leave it this way. It won't hurt it. Um, it will just it will rebubble. Uh, this was used quite a bit in old electronics, especially where they had coils on wood forms or something. Uh, these don't go bad. Not as a general sense. Not any more than any other type of IF transformer from any radio goes bad as far as the windings. They generally don't give too much trouble. The windings that are always talked about on the Focal 60 and I believe also the 70s use the same ones but is these little windings here now this is the antenna coil there's about seven turns of wire right here that connect uh, between this lead and this point and that that winding is actually just a shortwave antenna coil winding um, as far as broadcast goes it's not in the circuit or it's not used really um, it's only used basically or uh, energized and used basically when you're in shortwave. That's the coil that goes bad. And it goes bad because this ancient type of material, uh, kind of, I suppose, uh, for the sake of a better term, plastic, 
uh, starts deteriorating and um, expanding and everything and, and out yeah it, it does I don't think it really actually damages the winding as far as eating the copper up because it would affect this copper uh, more I think what it does is kind of, as it deteriorates it expands a little bit and breaks the this very very fine wire breaks it loose and plus there might be a little moisture that gets to this because it's got a very thin layer of uh, uh, I believe wax on it oscillator coil um, about three times the number of turns is what's on there uh, I can't remember the exact number it's this is the ticker coil it's in the other one that can go bad still not a huge number of turns uh, if it is open just carefully unhook it and unwind it get the direction correct and your wind, uh, the number of windings correct uh, it feeds from this point I think uh, yeah these two I believe yeah it's right there and it's kind of hard to see but it comes across here and hooks here so it, it comes off goes and then heads off this direction so that they're they're not hard to wind and both mine are are gone so uh, if you want to see uh, as far as uh, you want to put an insulator back on one of the great places to get a, a, a thin piece of plastic is from your uh, you're basically blow mo uh, vacuum molded uh, plastic that is used in packaging today. Uh, most of that is pretty thin, like you buy new stuff or even uh, where they make little containers like rivets or something like that. Uh, makes great little um, shield here insulator. If you want to see uh, a good video on working on one of these and and stuff and talking about them and and uh, making up a a piece to go on there and everything else. Um, Bob Anderson at B Anderson TV on YouTube. Um, go to his channel and go to the playlist. Uh, go to the Philco 60 playlist I believe it's video or part number four is where he goes over this so great resource check it out now uh, see let me check on questions here okay uh, I had one question from one person about exactly do I know when or have any idea when they start putting backs on radios uh, a lot of your 40s radios by the time you got in the, the, the late 40s post war would had backs on them but there were pre-war radios they were um, hit and miss on those a lot of the consoles the table or not uh, the floor model radios had backs. In fact, my Philco uh, that I did, you know, videos on. I, do, I still got to do the final one. I will get to that. Um, but that Philco 387XX uh, radio um, with a concentric tuning on it and everything. It's uh, it's a floor model console. That's what the XX stands for, and um, it has a back although mine don't but I got a picture of what the back should look like but there's little clips on there where the back goes on most of these cathedral or cathedrals were or baby grand radios is the proper name for them and a lot of those style radios and a lot of the tabletops in in the 30s generally did not have backs with them uh, one quick telltale sign to know whether you got a radio that should have had a back on it there will be somewhere on you know on the back uh, frame back there 
you'll see small holes or clips or something. If you don't have clips, you'll at least see the small holes where the screws went. If, you, if that wood has nothing in it, there's no clips, no holes or nothing. There was never a back on it. Um, so, uh, I hope that answers your question. Basically, uh, the radios I can think of that ha would have had backs, and not all of them did, would have been the floor models in the 30s. Uh, by the time you get in the, after the war, uh, one thing that they were doing on a lot of the radios on the backs, they were putting the loop antenna on there now which is basically actually the antenna coil that's what the loop antenna is it's the same thing as this coil and the older radios and it was a good place to mount it mount it on a piece of uh, uh, wood or, or cardboard or material and uh, just make that the back of your radio screw it right on and uh, so but pre-war uh, There might have been some in the early 40s, I'm trying to think. There might have been a few, like 1941, 40, and 1940 radios that were tabletop that might have had backs. But in, into the mid-30s and stuff, I, I can't think of any tabletop right off my, he right off my head that had a back uh, from the factory on it. So, I hope that answered your question. Um, another question was asked at, uh, about the name convention. Uh, why do they, uh, why did they use to call capacitors, condensers, and inductors chokes? Uh, they still call inductors chokes if that's what they are. A choke, more or less, is something that blocks AC. It chokes out AC. Uh, so, uh, in a lot of power supplies, even modern day power supplies, even switching mode to power supplies, they have chokes in there in the filtering circuit and they call them chokes. Uh, inductors, they are inductors, they have inductance, but inductors are more called inductors or generally more commonly called coils um, in bandpass filters circuits and stuff tuning circuits so the front end of the radio where your tuning's going on such as your antenna coil the oscillator coil things of this nature uh, coupled with the uh, tuning condenser making up a tunable filter so that you can tune in your radio stations um, these would be referred to uh, in a more stricter sense as inductors uh, but generally in a general sense called coils uh, so there's the interchangeability of these names um, has is still going on today so uh, today you'll hear a lot of the chokes called in power supplies common mold chokes, um, but they're nonetheless a choke. They choke out. Think of it as they choke the AC out. They the ripple. As far as condensers and capacitors come from, that's a uh, more interesting thing. Um, back in the day, condens. Uh, the name was coined out as condensers and just kind of uh, from way back years and years back uh, oh well over 100 years ago uh, it was believed that what it was doing was actually condensing the electricity okay just compacting or condensing it into a small area and so the name stuck condenser uh, by the time you get into the 30s um, in, in physics, they already knew, you know, basically that that isn't exactly what's going on and what is going on is about charges and everything else. Uh, the word capacitor, you know, a condenser has so much capacitance. And 
you know, formulas were made up after studying these and uh, on how to figure capacitance through a lot of experimentation and everything back in the um, late 1800s, early 1900s. Uh, mostly in more in science and physics. And by the mid-30s in the physics departments of universities and, and physicists, as far as they're concerned, they considered them capacitors. They have capacitance. It wouldn't change as far as electronics goes um, until probably in the 60s, um, late 50s, early 60s, or sometime in that period, uh, mainly because uh, at universities uh, with engineers, like electrical, electronic engineers, students, being pretty much forced into the issue that this is capacitor. It's capacitance. So it's a capacitor, not a condenser. Uh, so that's when the name convention changed. But um, that uh, the reason why they did call them condensers is they felt that they actually condensed the electricity in uh, into that thing that we call a capacitor. And, uh, and the name changed sometime basically in the 60s. Uh, a lot of us older guys, we interchange back and forth, and you will hear that, so uh, just accept, I, I don't know, just kind of accept it, I guess. It, 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 the name interchanges, so don't worry about it too much. As far as inductors and chokes, again, chokes are still used today. I mean, the, the word is to describe a particular inductor. Um, they use a lot of uh, coils uh, to describe other type of inductors, uh, which are generally more your tuning uh, bandpass filtering circuits, tuning circuits. So, I hope that answers your question. And yeah, well, this video is pretty long, as usual. Anyway, uh, so on the next video, we'll be getting into starting to get things put together I'll work up getting this put into its can and getting some other stuff clean getting the uh, Bakelite cans um, basically filled with capacitors and uh, stuff need a little more cleaning but uh, and uh, moving on from there getting the electrolytics rebuilt and ready to go in uh, I got to clean up I, I pulled the uh, excuse me here uh, I got clean these up the shells off that transformer clam shells so uh, you know they're quite rusty so they need to uh, be sanded down and primed a couple coats uh, rusty metal primer and Sanding in between and painting black. The uh, main transformer, and this is what they look like when they're not burned up. Um, I'll take some uh, wire brush and brush off this, clean it up a little bit, and then it should be black, uh, flat black. I've got some flat black I use a paintbrush with, and I'll paint the, the sides. So, that's where I'm at, and uh, so on the next video we'll be just kind of continuing on with it and everything and uh, going over um, stuff that we run into, and again, thanks for your comments, uh, and uh, Phil, thanks for your comment. Uh, I... I hear where you're at. I understand. I get quite upset uh, when in the past they did shoddy repairs that especially when it does damage it 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 it, it really upsets me and angers me. Uh, it is quite a pain to deal with. So anyway 
I think that's about all I got for you. So if you like the video, give it a big thumbs up. If you're new to my channel, I uh, enjoy seeing restorations and learning about theory and stuff on anything tube equipment. Uh, and if you haven't subscribed, subscribe. That way you'll know when new videos are coming up. So if you have any other questions, leave them in the comments and I will get to them and answer them. Thanks again for watching and I'll see you guys on the next video.